He sat there like a normal person. Not worried, not wondering how it happened, uh, just thankful that it did. His face was calm and his hands were clean and his eyes didn't have that wild, faraway, crazy look in them anymore. In fact, if, 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 you, if you'd known this guy, he would look really strange because he had clothes on. And he was known for just never even wearing clothes. He was sitting there calm and in control. If you hadn't seen it with your own eyes, you probably wouldn't have believed it. So, so there, there he sat calm and, 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 and in control, and, and it was so radically different from any way he'd ever been before. He, he lived at a place where nobody else lived, like literally, he lived in a cemetery. Now, don't think cemeteries like we have that are flat, we know, with tombstones coming up out of the ground. This was uh, a cemetery back in his day. Think of grave caves. That's how they buried people back in his day, and he lived in and among those caves. Like, how creepy is that when i grew up in butler there was a local legend that one of the cemetery one of the tombstones in the butler cemetery actually glowed in the dark at night and it wasn't uncommon for a carload of teenagers to load up and drive through the back parts of the cemetery looking for the one tombstone that would be glowing and whether they ever found it or not they always came out with the same story it was creepy it was scary. We rolled up the windows. We locked the doors. We got out there as fast as we could. If that was creepy, how creepy would it be like where this guy lived in these grave caves? If, if, if you lived nearby, you, you could probably hear him wailing at night, crying out in the day. Everybody knew who he was. Everybody tried to stay away from him if they could. They thought he was crazy. In reality, he was possessed by a demon. An evil spirit had taken control of him, and they never, people never knew what he would do. They knew what he was capable of. Like at first, they began to bind him. They put chains around him. They, they put irons on his feet. But this demon gave him supernatural strength, so he was able to break the chains and break those, those uh, fetters off his feet and just run free. And so they even stopped chaining him. They just gave him as much space as he needed. If, if you're living in that same general area and you heard him and he thought he was close, like, mamas, get your kids, get in the house. If you're out wandering in the hills, you might catch a glimpse of this crazy, wild, naked guy running through the woods. He wasn't in his right mind. He cut his body with stones. His life was absolutely out of control. And that is exactly how Jesus found him. So Jesus and his disciples, they're on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee where it was very Jewish, where they're looking for the Messiah. He kind of set up his headquarters over there. That's where Jesus was. And one day Jesus said, let's sail across the Sea of Galilee to the western side. I'm, I'm tired. He's, he's been healing and, and uh, preaching and teaching and doing miracles. And so he's super tired. So while they're on the lake, in the boat, partway across, Jesus fell asleep in the boat. And as it happens in that, on that lake so often, this huge storm came up and waves are crashing over the boat. The disciples are like, we're going to die. So they woke Jesus up and said, don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus looked at them like, and then he looked at the, call, the storm and the wind and the waves. And he said, be still. And immediately everything went calm, except for the disciples. They're like, oh, my gosh. Who is this guy in the boat with us? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So that happens on the way over to the, uh, to the other side of the lake. They land, and that's when they meet this guy who lived among the grave caves. They, he, they, they see this guy. He sees them, and here's what happened. If you've got your Bibles, just tap your app, Mark chapter 5. We're going to walk through verses 6 through 20. Not going to read them all, but we'll walk through them all. Mark 5, verses 6 through 20. Here's how Mark writes this, verse 6. When that man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. What does that tell you about this guy? I mean, here's this guy who has terrorized the countryside. He's been running around wild and naked, who everyone has been afraid of and who they know has supernatural strength. Yet when he sees Jesus from a distance, he runs to Jesus and falls on his knees in front of Jesus. What's that tell you about this guy? 
Yeah, he knew. He recognized Jesus, right? Something in, 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 in this demon, this demon recognizes both the divinity and the authority of Jesus. Verse 7, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Now, a couple of things from those two verses I want us to, to connect with this morning. First of all, that was not the man speaking. That was the spirit. That, that was the, 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 the demon speaking. As soon as that spirit saw Jesus, it recognized who Jesus was. But even more importantly, did, did you catch this? Jesus recognized who it was. Before the spirit spoke, Jesus waged war, and Jesus commanded that evil spirit to come out. And here's why Jesus did that. When Jesus looked at this man, he did not see him the way everybody else saw him. He didn't see some wild, crazy, scary guy. He saw this man for who he could become. Jesus looked at this guy and saw the man that he created and who he could be turned into. And so Jesus began to do what Jesus so often did. Jesus began to do life change. Jesus wanted to rescue this guy. Jesus differentiated the spirit from the man. See, the man's condition did not change the man's value to Jesus. Jesus just wanted to change this man's life. So let's keep reading. Verse 9. Then Jesus asked him, not the man, but the spirit, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. Uh-oh, this dude's got a problem. He's like a Marriott for demons and a whole bunch of checked in, and they're not interested in checking out. They have made their residence in this guy's life, a whole bunch of them. Verse 10, and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. So this is an amazing scene. I'm hoping that you're picturing this as we're reading through it together. Jesus stands there unfazed by what Mark tells us is a legion of demons. Does anybody know what a legion was back in the day? 5,000 soldiers. 5,000. So here's, here's Jesus standing in front of this guy who has thousands of demons in him, and Jesus stares them down. This demon or these demons, they're pleading with Jesus, hey, don't send us out of the area. And whether that's a monologue or a dialogue, be sure of this. Court is in session. The king is about to issue a verdict. Jesus is about to render a judgment, and these demons are scared of him. I, I wonder during this whole scene what the apostles are doing. Because remember, they're there, right? Don't, don't lose sight of what all is going on. You got Jesus, you got the man, you got thousands of demons inside this man. Then you got the apostles, the disciples. My hunch is they're behind Jesus, scared to death, right? Peeking out from behind it. Jesus, you got this, right? We're here if you need us. Hope you don't need us, right? So, so they're, they're probably scared to death, hiding behind Jesus. But here's what happened. There was a hill nearby where about 2,000 pigs, a huge herd of pigs, was, was feeding, and when the demons looked over and saw that, they said, hey, Jesus, if you're going to send us out of the man, at least send us into those pigs. And Jesus said, okay, he sent them into the pigs. And Mark tells us that the moment the demons went into the pigs, the entire herd rushed down this steep hillside and drowned in the lake. Here's what happened next. Pick up with verse 14. Those tending the pigs, oh, there's more people there. So you got Jesus, you got the man, you got the demons, you got the disciples, now you have these pig herders, right? So they're there taking care of their, their pigs. This is not a Jewish area, obviously, right? Because pigs are unclean. That would never be a Jewish area. So this is a very Gentile area, non-Jewish people. So those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were what? Doesn't that sound odd to you? I mean, seriously, think about it for a moment. This is a guy that's terrorized them. This is a guy that's been running naked and crazy. Like, keep your kids away, stay your distance. This is a guy who's been, been just a, a, a holy terror in their whole area. And now they come out and they see him sitting there in his in his. Like in clothes, bonus, in his right mind, and they're what? Afraid. Don't you think amazed? 
would be a better response? How many of you all remember, if you're out of school, how many of you remember picture day in school? All right, let me take you back to Rich's third day picture, third grade picture day, okay? So we're talking going way back before digital cameras. Like digital cameras make it so easy. You can, the photographer take, you know, one, five, ten pictures. Hopefully you're half alive looking in one of those pictures, right? But back in the day before digital, it was all rolls of film. So you know, after about 30 students, the, 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 the photographer's like, hold on, I've got to take a break. got to put some more film in my camera. I'll be right back. And they get the new roll in there. And man, every kid, you got one shot. Like, I hope I don't look like a goober, right? You, one shot because they're not taking one or five or ten. They're taking one of you, and you don't get a chance to preview it. You just hope you smiled. You hope you didn't close your eyes. You hope you had your hair combed, you know. And that made picture day, getting the pictures back, Super terrifying and super exciting all at the same time. Like your teacher would walk in, some of you remember this, with a big stack of all these big envelopes with your school pictures in them, and you got yours, and you tell me there's not prayer in school? Hmm. Because you open that thing terrified, please don't let me look weird, God, please let it be a good picture this year for once in my life, you know, and you pull it out. But do you remember what your classmates wore for picture day? I do. Some of them. I remember Stacy McCarron. Stacy McCarron, she was God's gift to third grade little boys. Mm. She was beautiful. I was in love with her from kindergarten on. I, I, not anymore, sweetheart. Where's Marsha? Um, but, but she, she was my like elementary, you know, love life. And, and she was rich, and she was beautiful, and she was sweet, and she was kind. She was perfect, you know, for third grade. Um, but she, she, her mom and dad, they owned McCarran's department store in downtown Butler. She looked like a princess every single day. So picture day for her was just ordinary, right? You look the same as you always do, sparkly and perfect, so well done. But for the majority of us, we had to up our game a little bit on picture day. We had to wear a shirt that didn't have jelly stains on it, preferably a shirt that mom picked out, which usually meant there was a collar of some sort and didn't have a big number on the front or, or a cartoon character. And, and we had to make sure we used a comb, not just our fingers that day, to comb our hair. And so we kind of upped our game, the majority of us. But there was always the one kid, wasn't there? who came in for picture day, it was like a mass transformation for one day in this kid's life, like J.T. Zulik, third grade, J.T. Zulik. I remember J.T. J.T. was the kind of guy, he's like one of the best athletes you ever meet, but he's always on the verge of getting in trouble because he's just so much energy. He was always wanting to climb, jump, do something, so he's always getting in trouble by the teacher. He's the kind of kid who's your friend, but you're afraid of him at the same time, you know? That was JT, and, and I remember picture day in third grade, JT Zulik, he comes into class, we're like, oh, it's a new student. We didn't recognize him. He came in. He had on clothes that weren't dirty from the bus stop. He had his hair. Listen, his hair was combed and parted, like with a comb and combed over, and it was staying that way. Like his mom must use a whole can or two of hairspray on it. It's before gel. And, and we're like, who's the new kid? Oh, JT. Wow. We weren't afraid of him. We were amazed at him because he sat there clothed and in his right mind. <laughs> right? You, you had that kid in your class. Too. But, but go back to Jesus. Right here, here's Jesus. And he's standing there. And here's this, this guy who's sitting there clothed in his right mind, which is a drastic switch from what people have ever known him. And they're... They're not amazed. They were what? They're afraid. And they say, we, we don't understand this. Now, understand, they were not Jews, right? They're not looking for a Messiah. They're not looking for someone to come and save them. Their lives are fine. We're eating, we're eating ham sandwiches. Things are good, right? They didn't need Jesus. They don't know who Jesus is. They're, they're just, something big has happened. And they're so afraid, they asked Jesus to leave. And so here, here's what happened. Jump down now to verse 18. So they're begging, begging Jesus to leave. Verse 18. As Jesus was getting in the boat to leave, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were, guess what? amazed. So here's what's happening. Jesus says, okay, I hear your voice. You're begging me to leave. I'm, I'm going to leave. These people are so afraid of him. He gets in the boat to leave. But the moment he does, the other guy who just, he just healed starts to get in the boat with him. And Jesus says, oh, hold on. But Jesus, I want to come with you. 
I want to adore you. I want to admire you. I want to worship you. Hey, that stuff's good. I want you to worship me. I want you to adore me. I know that's good, but I have something better for you. Jesus knew the better. He says, you go back home and you show everybody your new story. And you tell everybody my story of what I've done for you. Jesus sends this guy out to become an evangelist. And he goes to this place called the Decapolis. Big fancy schmancy word for ten cities. Deca, ten, polis, cities. So there's an area of ten cities on the other side of the Jordan. Nine on the other side of the Jordan. One right on the Jordan River. But it's an area that these people aren't going to church. They're not showing up for synagogue. They don't know the name of Jesus. They don't know the name of God. They're not, they're not worshiping him. They're worshiping all these false gods. And, and, and Jesus said, I, I've got a great idea. Instead of coming in the boat and just simply falling at my feet and adoring me, how about instead of obeying me? And how about going out to a place where people aren't going to, to, to church and you go be the church where they are? And Jesus sends this guy out. He begins to tell people his story, Jesus' story, and they all were what? Amazed. I love the story of this guy. I, I, I love the way that Jesus uses him and sends him out. I mean, before meeting Jesus, his life was a wreck. But after meeting Jesus, his life's an amazing witness. This is one of the best before and after stories in all of Scripture. Did you know that every single person can have a before and after? Did you know that you can have a before and after? In fact, if you are already a follower of Jesus, you are a before and after story, and you should be telling people that you have a before and an after. I mean, before you, you had a before you, the old self, then you met Jesus. He did his work in you, and now you're the after. You're a new creation. You have an after story. It's called life change. This is what Jesus does. We'll get into life change more in November, but, but there are a couple of things I want you to hear and focus on from this event in Scripture this morning. And here's the first one. Number one, Jesus is passionate about life change. You saw that in this meeting with this guy, the demoniac. It doesn't matter how messy your life is. Jesus will stand right in front of you unfazed and absolutely focused on you, not on your addiction, not on your sexual sin, not on uh, the, the other sins of your life, not on uh, the challenges of your life. He's going to focus on you because he looks at you. He says, I created you, Sean. I know who I want you to be. And he focuses on you and leads you to where he wants you to be. Life change. And I love this about Jesus that we learned from this passage. Listen, you, you need to understand this. Your condition Whatever you bring to Jesus, your condition does not change your value to Jesus. He's not afraid to take on a, a whole legion of demons, so I guarantee you he's not afraid to take on whatever you bring to him. And if you let him, he will change your life because Jesus is passionate about life change. Here's the second thing I want you to take home today. Number two, what you do with your changed life matters. Jesus wants you to adore him, but more importantly than that, he wants you to obey him. He wants you to get, get out of the boat and start telling people his story. Think about this. What if, what if the guy that, that Jesus healed that day would have stayed in the boat and gone with Jesus wherever Jesus went? Well, it's not a bad thing, right? Jesus would have another, you know, admiring fan and an adoring follower, another worshiper, and that's all good stuff. But what about those people in those 10 cities who the church wasn't going to reach? What about those people because they're not looking for Jesus? What about all those, the entire population of 10 cities who desperately need Jesus? What would have happened to them? Well, they wouldn't have heard the name of Jesus. They need Jesus. So Jesus sent this man to them. They're, they're never going to walk into a normal church. They need the church to be bold and risky and faithful so they could come to know Jesus. So Jesus sends this guy to be that. So here's a challenge for us. If Jesus is so passionate about life change, then shouldn't his church be also? If we had one ounce of Jesus' passion to change people's lives for his glory, how many lives would we be changing? Well, 63,500 to get started. 
They're within a striking distance of us who have no relationship with Jesus and no church home. If we had one ounce of Jesus' passion, and listen, and I, I know there are exceptions to the rule, but it just seems to me like in the church, we are more about getting in the boat to, to admire Jesus than getting out of the boat and using our changed lives to change lives. About two, two and a half years after this event with the demoniac, Jesus stood outside of Jerusalem on a, on a hillside with those same disciples, the ones who were cowering behind him on that day, are now standing around him on this day, and he had a conversation with them. It kind of went something like this. It's your turn. For three years, I've poured into you. You've seen my miracles. My goodness, you took part in my miracles. You carried the bread and the fish out to 5,000 plus people. Peter, you walked on water. Some of you laid hands on people and healed them. You've done all this while I was with you, but guess what? I'm going away. Jesus was about to ascend to, he ascend to heaven. And he said, now it's your turn. You take everything I've poured into you. Go pour out into the lives of others. You go out and you be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth. Don't you think that if Jesus is passionate about changed lives, we should be too? Here at Community Church, we say it like this. Follow Jesus and lead others to him. Say it with me. Follow Jesus and lead others to him. It's simple. It's simple. But that's what God calls us to do. Listen, as a church, we have a before and after story too. We're not the same church we used to be five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. All that up to now is our before. We're about to open up something new. We're about to step into something brand new. We're about to live into our after. And how we do that really, really matters. You may not have heard a whole lot of this message. I hope you have. But I want you to hear this. Here's why this is so important. As the church, we are not just a placeholder for Jesus when he comes back. We are stakeholders in what Jesus is doing. I think it bears repeating. As Jesus' church, we are not just a placeholder when, when Jesus comes back. Hey, Jesus, glad to have you back. We kept everything just like it was, so your, your room's the same. Uh, everything's the same like when you left it, so you can pick up where you left off. Jesus is going to say, not well done, because we're more than that. We are stakeholders in what Jesus is doing. We're not supposed to be burying our talents. We're supposed to be taking them and using them for God's glory. We're supposed to be the people who, who don't just step in the boat and admire Jesus. We go out and we obey Jesus and we tell people his story. Friends, honestly, if we're not about changing lives, then what are we about? Because there are a lot of people, a lot of family, a lot of friends, a lot of people around us who don't know Jesus, who desperately need to know Jesus. And they're not going to walk into a normal church. They've proven that. We've been here for decades. And guess what? They've never walked in. A lot of churches around us have been here longer than we have. They've never walked in. Sitting here on, on the weekends and hoping they're going to walk in, that's not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. We have to be risky and bold and daring as God's church to go out to where they are. Listen, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're living in the Decapolis. We are surrounded by more people that don't know Jesus than people that do. And it's our job, and it's our responsibility, and it's our privilege to take the story that Jesus has worked in our lives and tell it to others and connect their story then to his. Because we are stakeholders in what Jesus is doing. It doesn't happen by us getting in the boat. And can I remind us this morning that that's exactly what Holy Communion is all about. You know, so often we come to Holy Communion and it's like, I got to get real serious now. I got to get, 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 get sad I got to get down, and Holy Communion is not that. Holy Communion is like, oh, my gosh, Jesus, you gave your life for me. That's a yay God moment. I remember your suffering. I remember your death, not just with sadness, but now with joy because I live on this side of the cross. But it's about something more. It's not just about Jesus' sacrifice for you and me. It's about our sacrifice now for him. When Jesus offered the bread in the cup to the people who were around him, his best friends in the upper room that night. It wasn't just, hey, this is what I'm doing for you, but now this is what I expect you to start doing for me because you're stakeholders 
and what I've started. So this morning, I invite you to receive Holy Communion through that lens. Yes, remember what God has done for you, but make a commitment to start doing what God is calling you to do for Him. This is Holy Communion.